All right, welcome everyone. I'm happy to have two uh, early career speakers here with us today, Alexandra Fogg and Hannah Perry. Uh, they'll both be following up with our talk from last week on uh, geomagnetic disturbances and the GEM focus group on GICs. Our first speaker today is gonna to be Alexandra Fogg and she's going to be discussing space weather effects on Ireland. So Alexandra completed a master's in physics with space science in space science and technology at the University of Leicester, which also included a term abroad at McMaster University. Following from this, she completed a PhD at the University of Leicester, focusing on super darn observations of ionospheric convection. She then moved to the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies to work on observations of radio emissions from the wind waves data set, examining auroral kilometric radiation. Currently, Alexandra is an IRC Government of Ireland postdoctoral feather, fellow sorry, studying both global and local effects of geomagnetic sudden commencements at the Earth. Now, with that, Alexandra, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction and thank you for inviting me to give a talk today. Um, so, yeah, my name is Alexandra. Today I'm going to be talking about space weather effects on Ireland. Um, so just attempting to make my slide change. I'll just go next like that. Um, so a little bit about me, um, you introduced me quite well there, so maybe I don't need this slide anymore. Um, but I did my PhD at the University of Leicester looking at ionospheric convection and field line currents and things like that, mostly E and F region ionospheric science. Since then, I have moved to Ireland. I work at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies and I did two years working on terrestrial radio emissions, so looking at links with solar wind magnetosphere coupling um, and uh, with geomagnetic indices, so linking that high up um, space-based observation to the ground. And now I'm an Irish Research Council Government of Ireland postdoctoral fellow working on sudden commencement. So that's really rapid compressions of the Earth's magnetosphere um, and particularly looking at global effects and also effects on, um, on Ireland relating to Irish space weather effects. Um, and here's a picture of our research group. Here's me. I guess you can see me on the camera anyway, but I thought I'd point myself out with an arrow as well. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. So today I'm going to be talking about extreme space weather and island. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some of our ground-based magnetometer measurements that we have. And then I'll talk a little bit about the analysis technique I'm going to use, which is extreme value analysis. Then I'm going to show the extreme value analysis we've done on the Irish magnetometer data um, and talk about the causes of those extreme observations. So linking back to storms, substorms and sudden commencements. So first, I'm going to talk a bit about the Magnetometer Network of Ireland, or MAGI. So this is a network of ground-based magnetometers across the island of Ireland. So you can see them on this map here. So we have Armagh up in the north, Dunsink, which is at Dunsink Observatory in Dublin, where we work, Burr in the Midlands, and Valencia down in the southwest. Um, so I'll be using Valencia data, which actually goes back um, quite a long way to the 1800s, I think. Um, but is at minute resolution since 1991. So we'll be using go back, going back to 1991 because we've got that minute resolution, which is what we need um, to, to compare with what else is going on in the magnetosphere with the standard sort of omni resolution. Um, so from that Valencia Island data, I'll be calculating the horizontal component of the magnetic field B from the N and E components. So N is magnetic north, E is magnetic east. And then also it's time derivative, dB dt, um, using this equation here. And this is just a point to stop and think that although we're looking at B and dB dt, these can be linked to um, essentially the, the specific space weather around the specific geology of Ireland, um, and also can be related to any other station at that latitude as well. And what's interesting, actually, if I go back about the Valencia station, is about half of its field of view is the ocean. Um, and those who are experts in ground-based magnetometers will know um, that that makes a difference in the measurement um, there. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the technique we use. So we use extreme value theory. And this is we're de dealing with the extreme values, so the tail end of the distribution far away from the medium. 
And why we're interested in that, it's, it's those extreme events which drive really extreme space weather. Um, so the space weather events which might knock out power lines or um, ground planes, that's what we're really interested in when we're thinking about predicting space weather. So that's why we're looking at the extreme values. So extreme value theory has been used widely in other fields to predict um, events like earthquakes and 100 year floods. Um, but as I said, we're using it here to characterize space weather. So I've got an example of where this has been used before in the field. So recently, Sean Elvidge used it to predict return values in the AA index. And the AA index is an index based on ground data, which goes back quite a long way. Um, and we have a plot here. This is a quantile quantile plot comparing the distributions of um, the data itself. So from the AA index on the X axis and the model distributions on the Y axis. And essentially how this plot works is each of these points has the same probability in both um, distributions. Um, so it's uh, essentially showing where the points lie on the line and where the distributions agree and where we stray away far from the line. For example, here, the distributions are not agreeing. Um, this is split into solar maximum and solar minimum. I should have mentioned that, sorry. Um, so red being maximum and blue being minimum. But you can see generally the model agrees fairly well. Um, it's fairly close to the y equals x line throughout. And using this model, um, they calculated return levels. So for 10, 50, 100, 500, and 1,000 years. So they've extrapolated that model beyond the data that we have to give an 1,000 year event. And just looking at the combined data, so that's data for solar minimum and solar maximum, they find that, for example, every 500 years, you see a value of 1,321 at least once. That's what those return values mean. So that's your 500 year event or as similar to your 100 year flood or, um, but this is a 500 year space weather event. Um, so this is just an example of how it's been used before, but here we're going to apply it to the Valencia ground magnetometer data. So what is the technique that we use? So we're really looking to characterize the baseline conditions at Valencia. So how do we know what is a normal value at Valencia if we don't know what an extreme value is? So often we will compare values to the median of a distribution and use that to say, oh, it's above the median, it's below the median. But if we want to characterize whether something is extreme, we need to determine what an extreme value is. Um, so that's what we're doing in this analysis. And we're coming up with these extreme values so that we can go back to our data on the day-to-day -day basis and say whether what's going on is unusual or not. So the first step in this technique is to detect those extremes itself. And there are different ways you can do this, but in our study, we use block maximum. So the block maximum technique, what that means is we've taken our data, 30 years of it, and chopped it up into calendar years. And in each calendar year, we extract the, um, the peak value in that year, and that is our extreme. So you have as many extremes as you do years of data using that technique. Now you can change the um, period over which you chop it up. It doesn't have to be a year. And we experimented with that, and we found that actually it doesn't have an impact on the distribution of the extremes that you get out. Um, so it just has an impact on the number of extremes that you get. So we chose a, a year because that gives you a full year of ionospheric seasonality. So then with these extremes that you detected, you can then fit a generalized extreme value distribution. And that I'm going to call it a GEVD model from now on. So we've got the extremes, we fit the model, and then we can use the GEVD model to predict the return values. And I should say here, this is the equation for the generalized um, extreme value distribution here. So it's a, an exponential that has um, shape, location, and scale parameters um, in it. Um, so then when we fit that model, we can use it to predict the return values. We come up with a table of return values similar to the one I just presented from Sean Elbridge. So before we go on to talk about the analysis itself, I wanted to convince you that the extremes are real. <laughs> so one of the questions I got from co-authors and from people when I present this is, how do you know your extremes aren't just an instrumental error or they're just one data point amongst quite a low background? 
So we have gone and plotted out the extremes to check this. Um, so this is the third highest extreme in B that we have observed in the 30 years, but it is the highest one that has IMF and solar wind data, and that's why I've chosen to present it here. So in the top panel here, we have B in black and DBDT in red, and the B extreme is where the dotted line is throughout all the panels. So you can see that it's not at one point, I'm on a low background. It doesn't look like an instrumental error either. It is a smoothly sort of growing and changing um, form in the B here. So I think we can be as convinced as one can be that this is um, a real observation. And the B DBDT um, is, this is not a DBDT extreme, it's a B extreme. So DBDT is bobbling around um, and you can see where B changes more quickly, DBDT is higher, and that makes sense. So what we want to investigate, what is driving this extreme? Um, so we've plotted out various different um, data products from the Omni data set here. So we have SIMH in black in this panel and the polar cap index in pink. Um, so SIMH is below minus 200 at the time of the, uh, of the extreme. Um, and that's well below sort of quiet values. It's um, almost certainly in storm time here. Um, so we have geomagnetic storm ongoing in the background or in the foreground, I guess, depending on your, um, depending on what else is going on. Um, the polar cap index is uh, above 15 at points and that's very high um, for the polar cap index. So the median values have been presented have been about 0 0.8 for polar cap index distributions. Um, so that's suggesting that we're getting really strong flux transport across the polar cap. Moving on to the auroral electrojet indices, um, what we would expect if we saw a substorm in AL would be a steep negative, uh, a steep downwards curve, and then followed by a slightly less steep upwards curve, um, forming a substorm bay. And we're not seeing that, but certainly we're seeing some elevation in the AE index here, um, which is, is, is quite high. So perhaps there's bright auroral emission happening, but without a substorm. When we look at the IMF, we can see we've got quite high values of IMF here. At the beginning of the interval, IMF BZ is around minus 50, which I hope you'll agree with me is, uh, is very strong BZ. But even by here, when it's decayed a little, we're looking between 10 and minus 10 and minus 20 nanoteslas, which is quite high. Uh, by this point, it's dominated by a strong BY. Um, but we know that a BY can also contribute to magnetic reconnection, just changes the location of the reconnection sites. So we're looking at a very strongly driven interval here in terms of the IMF. Similarly, similarly with the solar and plasma data. So here we have pressure in black, density in blue and velocity in gold. You can see that the pressure is very high. Um, I think it's about 10 times average values if, if when it's going up to 30 here. Um, and the velocity is also very high, I think about twice um, medium values when we're looking at the distribution. So we're looking at a magnetosphere that's quite compressed, actually. Um, and just as one note, we did do the extreme value analysis on all of these parameters as well. I'm not going to present that in detail. Um, but what it gives us the result of is that this extreme in B is driven by a five to 10 year event in B total. SIMH and the solar wind velocity. So we're looking at a compressed magnetosphere strongly driven by the IMF um, with an un ongoing geomagnetic storm. And that's what's generating this extreme in this case. But we'll look at that statistically towards the end of the talk as well. So having detected the extremes, we can look at their distribution in magnetic local time. Um, so here I have a plot of magnetic local time histograms. So we have noon at the top, dawn on the right, dusk on the left, and midnight at the bottom. Um, each bar, the radius of the bar shows the number of extremes detected in a one hour width magnetic local time bin with B in gray and DBDT in purple. And what we can see is more extremes are detected particularly for B in the pre-midnight sector. And that's where most of the substorm onsets are happening. So we're linking back to substorm activity here. Um, so that's a really interesting result. Um, it's, uh, and we'll go back to the causes, as I said, statistically at the end, but it's interesting to know that we're seeing 
as Island and the Valencia station rotates into and out of that pre-midnight se sector as the Earth rotates, we're seeing more extremes in the pre-midnight sector. So now I'm going to look at the fitting of the GEVD model. So what I have here are three plots which each show that how well the model fits to the data in three different ways. Um, and firstly, we're looking at the horizontal component of the magnetic field B, and I'll describe DVDT um, afterwards. So here we have the observations as triangles here. So these are the extremes we've detected. The model is an orange line and with the shade showing the confidence interval. And this is these are the B observed at least once per return period as a function of their return period. Um, and you can see the model fits best when we have more data and that's at the lower return period, the lower B values. And as we get up to very high B, these are the extreme extremes. Um, we see less of them. Uh, there are fewer events, so we can't fit the model as well. Um, but you can see certainly the fitting could be improved. And something we are trying is fitting to different types of distributions. So rather than a GEVD distribution, we've also tried a log normal distribution and things like that. Um, so then we move on to compare the PDFs of um, the two sets. So we have the observations in gray and the model in orange again. Again, you can see it fits the general shape, but it could fit better. So that's a work in progress at the moment. We then have a quantile quantile plot. So we have the observations on the y-axis and the model on the x-axis. Again, we see that, so when the points are close to the line, the two distributions are agreeing. They agree best where we have most data and don't agree so well where we have these really extreme extremes. So what we're seeing is a model fitting, which perhaps needs some improvement, um, but we can still use that model as it is to predict return values, which is what we've done. Um, so we have the return period in this column and the resulting value with error bars. Um, and what you can see is that, for example, every 20 years, Valencia is going to observe a value of 697 nanoteslas at least once. And so this is giving us a characterization of when we see 700, for example, we know that's a 20 year event. Um, so that's a really uh, interesting result there. Um, but we also have our error bars, which are quite large, but at least we have error bars. They're just very large. <laughs> There's nothing else I can really say about that. And um, so we will hope to improve the fitting of that model by using a different distribution. So then, as I alluded to, we're going to discuss the causes of the B return values. So the causes of those extremes that we're seeing. So what I've done is use three event lists, a storm event list, a substorm event list, and a sudden commencement event list, separated them into different phases. And then what I've done is extracted the maximum Valencia B observation during each of these phases. And then they are plotted only if they exceed the two year return value, which was 222. So what we can see is that storms are contributing far more extremes than substorms or sudden commencements. And actually, there's no contribution from sudden commencement onset. But that is the bottom of the step change. If you think of the sudden commencement in the magnetometer data as a step change, at, particularly at the equator, um, the bottom of the step change is where we're going to have the smallest B. Um, so it's not surprising that there's no contribution from sudden commencement onset in this case. So now I'm going to move on and talk about DBDT. So I have the same plot again. We have the three plots examining um, the difference between the model and um, the observations. And the first thing you see is that the model fits the observations much better for DBDT than it did for B, um, with the exception of this very extreme extreme here. Um, the, most of the points are close to or inside the confidence interval here. The PDFs, again, compare pretty well, um, at least compared to the B distribution. Um, but as we experiment with the distribution for B, no doubt we'll experiment with the distribution for DBDT as well and try different shapes of distribution and see if we can get something that fits even better. Again, for the quantile quantile plot, the model and the observations agree best at the lower end of the values. Um, and this one point here again is relating to this very extreme um, value that we see there. So what we've got are the return values again. And for example, every 20 years, 
we're seeing an observation of at least 184.1 nanoteslas per minute at least once. Um, and again, the error bars are large, um, but uh, we have calculated them. So there we go. Um, and then again, looking at the causes of the DBDT return values, um, again, we're seeing that storms are contributing more extremes than substorms and sudden commencements. But all phases of all three events are representative. Um, and some of the more extreme events are coming from storms and sudden commencements. Um, so we've had discussions with um, collaborators in the field about this, saying that actually storms are much more energetic than substorms, perhaps. Even though we have many more substorms, we have of the order of 26,000 substorms in this study and about 400 storms and 400 sudden commencements, it's perhaps that storms are much more energetic. And for sudden commencements, again, we're looking at that step change. So the DBDT on a shape like that is going to be quite high because you're going from, you know, you're, you're changing very rapidly the shape in the, in the magnetometer trace. One other potential missing cause on this plot could be ULF wave activity or field line resonances. Um, but the Valencia data we have is only minute resolution. So we don't have the resolution that we need um, to characterize that activity. Um, so that's perhaps a further work to look at one of the other magnetometers in the network. For example, the Dunsink magnetometer it only has a few years of data, but we'll be able to characterize um, ULF wave activity because it's second resolution. Um, and then we can perhaps try and repeat this plot. So I think that's my last slide. Yep. So um, to conclude, I have predicted return values of extreme B and DBDT. We're seeing more of those extremes in pre-midnight mag magnetic local times. And we've examined how storms, substorms, and sudden commencements generate high DBDTs and high Bs. And we find that storms generally, even though there's less of them than substorms, are generating more high values, more extreme values um, than substorms. So I will leave my um, conclusion slide up there and welcome any questions. Um, all right, thank you, Alexandra, for a great talk. Uh, we do have a question, which actually comes to your kind of last slide here from Jason Durr. Um, how do you class substorms which might happen during a storm time? Um, have you looked at classifying storm time substorms at all? Yeah, so that is a next step. I'm just waiting on an event list from a co-author who has separated out storms uh, storms with substorms in them, storms without substorms, substorms within storms, and isolated substorms, if that makes sense. Um, and then we're going to repeat the analysis. And I think that will be really illuminating. Um, so yes, that's that's to do. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Um, and I have a follow-up question. Um, you showed your dial plot, which did seem to, sh or which did show some uh, nice MLT dependence within your DBs and DB by DTs. Um, with regard to your breakdown, do you tend to see, are the sudden commencements uh, events, are they isolated to the day side or can they drive large DB and large DB by DT anywhere within the magnetosphere? Um, so I think, uh, sudden, so the main effect of the sudden commencement is likely to be on the day side, um, but essentially what you see is from a sudden commencement in a magnetometer is stratified by latitude and local time. Um, so at the equator, you'll see a step change. At the pole, you'll see a, an alpha wave type signature. And then the polarity of the, the wave will change with local time. Um, so in this plot, we're only looking at local time. So I would expect the largest sudden commencement effect to be at noon um, and then it to sort of drop off as you go around in local time because you're getting more of a glancing blow, if that makes sense, with the compression as you go around in local time. But authors have shown that you do see mag magnetometer effects at all local times from a sudden commencement. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we don't have any further questions. So I think we are able to move on to have this talk now. Thank you again, Alexandra. Thank you. All right, so Alexandra will be following, sorry.
Hannah will be following up Alexandra's talk uh, with some more discussion on geomagnetic induced currents. So Hannah Perry is a recent MSc graduate from the University of Alberta, where she also holds a Bachelor's of Science with a special specialization in astrophysics. During her MSc, Hannah worked with Professor Ian Mann, researching geomagnetically induced currents in Alberta, Canada's power grid using a gradient measure gradient magnetic measurement technique, which is what she'll be discussing today. Hannah, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you. You can see my screen okay? Everything's showing up? <laughs> uh, yep, we're in presenter view. All right. Uh, present. Okay, good. Awesome. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me talk today. Um, it's a part of the early career sessions for the seminar series. Um, the Kyle mentioned, my name's Hannah Perry, and I'm currently a researcher at the University of Alberta. Um, and yes, I just finished my master's in space physics at the U of A with Dr. Ian Mann. Um, today I'll be presenting the research I conducted during my master's entitled Monitoring and Assessment of Geomagnetically Induced Currents or GICs in Alberta's High Voltage Network. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge and thank the contributors and partners listed here as well as the um, as well as acknowledging the funding and data sources for this work. So a quick overview, uh, I'm going to start by introducing GICs, the processes which lead to GIC and their impacts on electrical power networks. I'll discuss our motivation to study GICs in Alberta um, and how we can remote sense GICs using an augmented design of a differential magnetometer measurement method or DMM method as I'll be referring to it, which was the primary focus of my research um, during my master's. Um, and I'll conclude by making some comments about future work involving industry collaboration. So this is the common, common image which illustrates the Sun-Earth connection and encapsulates the region of space which we study. And the solar terrestrial relationship deals with the influence of the sun and the sun's activity on our terrestrial environment, which encompasses the state of the magnetic environment, including the magnetosphere and the ionosphere to solar forcing. An extreme eruptive event on the sun, if directed towards Earth, has the potential to interrupt and damage human-made systems and infrastructure, including satellite operation, radio communications, and human spaceflight. However, the most threatening in terms of total societal impact to health, safety, and economic development is the effects of GICs on elect uh, electricity distribution systems. So GICs are just the final outcome in a series of electromagnetic processes, which together we refer to as the space weather chain. Um, and I'll be coming back to this schematic throughout my talk to show what elements of this complex and interdisciplinary problem uh, we are studying. So this schematic just provides that overview of the space weather chain starting at the sun. So you have a large eruptive event called a coronal mass ejection or CME, which carries high energy particles and magnetized plasma. And when those are directed towards the earth, they interact with and strongly disturb the magnetic field. These geomagnetic disturbances, or GMDs, can be measured using ground-based magnetometers, which we'll be doing um, later on. And then through inductive effects, the associated geoelectric field will drive currents in the conductive earth. And then when you have a grounded conductive infrastructure in a network, like a power grid, this excess low frequency current will also be driven through the grid. And this is what we call GICs. So GICs are quasi-direct currents, which when induced into a typically 50 or 60 hertz power system can cause saturation of transformer cores resulting in transformer heating um, and damage. They can cause voltage instability, misoperation, and in the worst case, long period blackouts. And the most recent example of this was, or the most drastic recent example of this was in March 1989, when a significant geomagnetic storm caused GICs in the Quebec power grid, causing over 6 million people to be without power for about nine hours. And so traditionally, GICs are measured by electrical transmission company using a Hall effect sensor at the grounding connection on the transformer. So it's inside the power substation, and this measures the DC current flowing through the transformer in and out of the ground. Um, but this requires consider considerable industry cooperation, um, and the data from these are quite scarce and they're hard to get our hands on for us academics. So hopefully I've convinced you now that not only the importance of studying and understanding GICs and their effects, but also have impressed upon you the interdisciplinary nature and therefore the complexity in studying these things. So it's just a motivation on why we are studying GICs in Alberta and why we're in a good position to do so. We're located in the northern end of a long um, 
a large interconnected network which spans the Western US and Canada. Um, operated and maintained by our group at the UVA, the Prisma uh, Magnetometer Array is a nationwide array which provides both historical and real-time geomagnetic data at a relatively dense spatial sampling. Um, so this provides good coverage GMD data in Alberta. We also have access to five, over 500 earth impedance measurements using the magnetotelluric method. This provides a detailed um, three-dimensional ground conductivity information. So how that electric field is inducing current in the ground. And lastly, um, during my master's work, we worked really hard in building relationships with power transmission companies in Alberta. Um, one of those companies is Altalink, um, one of the largest transmission line companies in the province. And so we have access to their GIC data from a few of their operating sensors in the province. So the drawbacks of using um, GIC measurements using a Hall effect sensor, including cost and limited data and data access, are addressed by using the differential magnetometer measurement method, or DMM. It is non-invasive and inexpensive and can be mobile. Um, so in the following slides, I'll present the development and field deployment of our DMM system, which involves taking a differential magnetometer measurement to derive the estimate uh, of GIC in the power system bringing together these two elements of the space weather chain. So the traditional DMM configuration involves two magnetometers, one deployed directly underneath the power line and one deployed a little ways away around 100 to 200 meters uh, perpendicular to the line. Both measure the background magnetic fields and the underlying sensor measures the magnetic signature of the GIC at the length of the line. When you take the difference between them, you can use this differential measurement um, to calculate an estimate for GIC through uh, application of Ampere's law. And an example of this um, DMM approach was shown in um, the UK uh, in a paper called uh, by, sorry, uh, Hubert et al. 2020. So what we've done differently was we decreased the distance between the main tometers. So instead of over 100 meters away, it's about 75 meters away from each other. And by doing this, the magnetic field associated with the GIC is resolvable by both sensors. So this schematic illustrates the geometry um, that we used. We assume that the GIC can be estimated as a single equivalent line current, which flows through an infinite straight conductor along with the X direction, so into the page. Um, and therefore, the magnetic field associated with GIC is measured only in the Y component at the underlying sensor, but at the remote sensor, it's a combination of Y and Z components. And so the advantage of doing this is you get two differential measurements, delta BY and delta BZ, which give you two independent estimates of GIC and allows you to reconstruct the clean GMD. So this is an image of our deployment um, region. Our DMM system was deployed North Edmonton along a north-south segment of a 500 kV line, bolded in blue there. Um, and we chose this power line for our proof of principle deployment um, as there is a hall sensor at the south end of the line at Ellerslie substation. So we could use that to validate our measurement. Also included on this map is the location of the Charisma Magnetometer Station at Ministic Lake. And I'll be using that in a later analysis, so I just wanted to show that for now for context. And the distance between Charisma and the power line is on the order of tens of kilometers. So these images are from our first deployment in 2021. We custom built and designed the system to be extremely mobile. And the priority of this system was mobility for use for temporary deployments on segments of the power grid where hall sensors and GIC monitors on the transformer um, are non-existent. So our system operated two three-axis flux gate mags um, housed in a simple concrete structure. Um, it was battery powered for this first deployment. Um, and since we, uh, we've since deployed a second uh, campaign and it's still operating right now with applied upgrades with a solar panel and modem. So it's now, um, can you, it can be put out for longer term with completely remote operation. So now we can validate this approach um, of the DMM method through um, comparing it against the transformer neutral to ground uh, data provided by Altalink. So this event we captured on October 12, 2021. Um, we recorded a moderate DMD event on the left. It's showing the magnetic um, measurement in the three components. And on the right is the difference between each um, 
And so notably, we see that in the X component, which is again parallel to the current flow, it experiences little to no um, fluctuations in the in delta B X. And that's really great because it's confirming that we have good cross calibration between our two sensors and supports our single equivalent line current assumption. We also see fluctuations in delta BY and delta BZ. And that's really great because it's indicating that GIC is actively flowing in the line. And now we can calculate a, a GIC um, estimate from this value. And that's what's plotted on the top panel here is the DMM drive GIC from delta BY and delta BZ. And the transformer neutral current is plotted below at from Ellerslie substation. And importantly, we see strong temporal and waveform correspondence between the two GIC values. Um, specifically, we see contemporaneous peaks around 640 and 1055 UTC. And just to note on this slide um, for this comparison, I'm comparing amps per phase in the DMM inferred GIC, meaning that this is the GIC per wire on the tower structure. So there were six phases, so six wires on the tower or, um, of the power line segment that we're measuring on. So if you want the total GIC flowing through that entire line segment, you can just multiply those magnitudes by six. Um, and at the bottom, I'm measuring or I'm receiving data from Alt Altalink, which shows the, oops, sorry, the total um, GIC traveling in and out of the ground inside the substation. So we don't have a full view of the uh, connections and the resistances inside the substation. Um, we're just seeing the total GIC going in and out of the substation as a whole. So that's kind of the limitation of, of this comparison. And so after looking at the GIC, we can reconstruct the GMD field and compare it to the nearby Charisma Magnetometer Station at Monistic, which is approximately uh, 50 kilometers away from our DMM location. And this provides a clean proxy GMD measurement. Um, and so we can see there's strong linear correlation between the two measurements. And this demonstrates that this, the success of DMM method in separating the GMD from the GIC magnetic field, um, which further confirms the current derived from DMM is indeed GIC flowing through the power line. And just for fun, we were able to catch a, a second event last month. So I thought I'd share that with you. Um, this is from our second uh, DMM deployment campaign. Um, again, this is a strong G3 class geomagnetic storm on March 23rd. Um, and we saw GIC reaching approximately 12 amps per phase, which is approximately a combined GIC through the power segment of 72 amps. And so when you compare the combined GIC estimate from DMM to the total um, substation GIC, the magnitudes are pretty close. Um, but again, that's a limitation of not knowing the full resistances. So we can't do a full. Uh, so there's a big caveat on the magnitude comparison is what I'm trying to say. And again, we can reconstruct the background GMD um, and the linear correlations here are showing that it's again, separating those two, feet, uh, two source fields. And this is great because it's showing that we can replicate the success of DMM on different days for different storm conditions. And so um, by the magnetotelluric method, we can use the geomagnetic field and the, geo, and the Earth's conductivity structure to calculate an estimate for the geoelectric field, ultimately responsible for driving GICs. And so as a secondary validation, we're gonna compare, directly compare the geoelectric field to the GIC and the power system. Like I mentioned, the geoelectric field can be calculated through a convolution of the horizontal GMD components. So your magnetic field, um, horizontal magnetic field components and the transfer function Z over mu naught. Now Z here is just the frequency dependent tensor which describes the ability of Earth's crust con to conduct current. And it's defined by the ratio of measured E and B from magnetotelluric surveys. So it's just this, um, middle uh, equation that does all the action. So we're gonna calculate geoelectric field at Monistic. And since Monistic is only approximately 33 kilometers away from Ellerslie and about 50 kilometers from D the DMM uh, location, we're gonna assume that the geoelectric field at this location um, is representative of the geoelectric field across the entire power line segment. And so we're gonna directly compare the geoelectric field estimate to the GIC at Ellerslie. 
and that's what's plotted here for that first event, October 12th. Um, and as you can see, large responses in the geoelectric field elements are well characterized by the neutral current elements. And again, this is the second event um, from last month, March 23rd. We're demonstrating here, again, EX and EY compared to the neutral current. And this is really powerful um, because it's drawing a direct link between the driver and the GIC response in the network. And it's showing that GIC is flowing through the Alberta network during even moderate geomagnetic storms and validates that the augmented DMM approach is indeed measuring an excess DC current in the power system ultimately caused by space weather. So to summarize, we developed and deployed a successful field test of the augmented DMM method and validated it against the true power network response measured by Ultlink. Um, we also demonstrated the geoelectric field is definitively associated with the observed transformer neutral current, which draws that link between driver and GIC response in the network. And so in the future, we're, we have already continued uh, GIC monitoring, monitoring using DMM with the implied, applied upgrades to demonstrate um, accurate local GIC characterization. And we want to be doing this at other places along the network where current GIC monitoring is unavailable for industry. Um, we've also begun investigating um, regional variability um, for, in the geoelectric field due to the Earth's conductivity structure um, and the response of GIC and other segments of the power grid in Alberta, particularly regions um, in Northern Alberta where we have um, the conductivity gradients may um, produce higher or more risky geoelectric field. And also um, now my priority is working towards um, continued collaboration with Altalink and other electrical power industry organizations in a formal partnership. Um, and so this will hopefully lead to opportunities to apply the DMM method by industry for temporary assessment of GICs where current GIC measurements are unavailable. Um, through this partnership, we plan to use power network configuration information, um, information about how the power network is configured and the resistance inside the substation will help us understand those DMM measurements better. Um, but we also want that information to develop an accurate province-wide model of the electrical power grid um, to further understand its vulnerability to GIC. And then, then in the long term, um, an operational service based on this de uh, developed model would be essential for real-time situational awareness, forecasting mitigation measures, and developing actionable protocols on the Alberta power grid for future GMD events. So I'm gonna finish there and just close out with this really beautiful video of the Aurora with some power lines in the foreground. Um, this was from the March 23rd event, um, and it was taken by uh, Ji Liu, who's a space physics PhD student at the U of A. So thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Oh, thank you, Hannah, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we do have one question in the chat, and I have a quick follow-up after that. Um, so George is wondering, um, do you have any estimate of what the largest current is that, can, uh, that the system can take before it collapses? That's a good question. Um, no, uh, not in terms of our uh, Alberta grid. That's something that we're trying to characterize um, with this work. But the current standards for, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen so that. Um, the current standards from uh, the National uh, North American Electrical Reliability Corporation, they're the ones who developed the standards for um, all power grids in Canada and the US. They've said that 75 amps per phase is dangerous amount of GIC. So um, in terms of what that does in our network, we kind of don't want to have to find out, but um, that's what we're trying to figure out for Alberta anyway. Uh, so I have a follow-up question uh, regarding um, one of your future studies uh, to look at ground conductivity. Do you guys have any plans to do similar analysis in Quebec and BC, which are kind of the extremes and differences of ground conductivity? So right now our focus is just in Alberta um, and we have access to all these ground impedance um, 
measurements that have been done for um, geological surveying for oil and gas. And so we're kind of making use of all those that have been done. Um, so no, the answer is no. Um, but we do have colleagues at like Hydro-Quebec. So, the, and they have, I mean, they've been doing this for a while, especially since the 89 storm. Um, so hopefully we can collaborate with them in the future. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and I have one last thing. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you have an upcoming GIC workshop in October. Did you want to mention anything about that today? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, actually. Um, I wasn't planning to, so this is great. Uh, let's advertise it to the community. So in this all stemmed from, I'm gonna give you a little story. In November, there was a GIC um, called Innovation Lab, and it kind of brought a bunch of people from the community together to write little projects on pre-proposals for future projects. And one of the outcomes of that work was the um, this GIC workshop that I was a part of with my group. Um, and we've moved forward with that and we're gonna be hosting a focused workshop on GICs in October, I believe the 24th to the 27th. <laughs> I hope those dates are correct um, in Maryland um, or in College Park, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, College Park, Maryland. Thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we're gonna be bringing hopefully, <clears throat> um, thanks Kyle, uh, representatives from industry and government and academia, um, hopefully to build a community around GICs with a common language um, so that we can foster collaboration in a sustained and supported way through more long-term funding and, and, uh, and so on. So um, yeah, I hope to see some of you there. And if you know any power industry folks that want to come, we're looking for <laughs> Um, more representation on the industry and government side. So, yeah. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Thank uh, you. So thank you, Hannah and Alexandra for two wonderful talks on GICs today. Um, George did ask me if we had any industry partners today. Um, I had never thought about trying to invite anyone. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to get some industry partners at the workshop that you guys have in October. Uh, so thank you again for two wonderful talks and I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.